to you about assessing forestry and timber options for carbon impacts, apparently. Um, I think the, uh, the, the uh, brief said that I would talk mainly about woodland creation options, but I'll also try to talk also about managing existing woodlands for carbon benefits or to minimize carbon impacts if they're negative. So what I'm gonna cover is some basic science, assessing forest woodland creation options, trying not to push into the screen while I'm doing it, and assessing management options for existing forests and quickly overview some available and emerging tools and end with some issues that we shouldn't forget. Now, um, I've got a 40 minute slot, which is great. Uh, hopefully I've got time to talk and bore you all to death. Um, I've also got a lot of slides, so but so I will try, but I will try to keep to time and, and make sure that um, yeah, we don't overrun. So let's start with the basic science. So this is basically carbon stock dynamics at different scales. Starting with, why are we doing all of this? Well, what's the problem? The problem is we've got serious climate change taking place. And what's causing the problem? It's the release of greenhouse gas emissions to the atmosphere. What can we do about the problem? Well, we can reduce the greenhouse gas emissions in the first place, and we can adapt our forest systems, which you've already heard about this morning. How do we show that our actions are leading to desired outcomes, particularly if we're trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions? Well, we do that with greenhouse gas and carbon accounting. How do we do that? Well, if you're working with some uh, a system like fossil fuels, this is simplified, but actually compared to forestry, it's pretty simple anyway. So, you know, here's how you can do a carbon accounting ca calculation for fossil fuels. Let's take a barrel of oil. One barrel of oil contains about 0.15 tons of fuel oil. The carbon content of fuel oil is about 0.85 tons carbon per ton of oil. So burning one barrel of oil, fuel oil releases about 0.15 times 0.85 is 0.13 tons of carbon. This is a bit of a change of pace from the earlier presentations, which are all nice and friendly and fluffy. I'm making you do mathematics. I hope that's OK. Um, so one tonne of carbon equates to 44 over 12 tonnes of CO2 released to the atmosphere. So consuming one barrel of oil, burning it, emits 0.13 times 44 over 12 is about half a tonne of CO2. So that was quite simple just basic arithmetic. Trouble is, it's not quite so simple when you get into forests and woodlands because, oh, that's interesting, the animations have stopped. Why have the animations stopped? Never mind, I'll just carry on as though there were no animations. So you've got a system which has all these carbon pools. You've got above ground biomass in your trees and below ground as well. You've got carbon in your litter. You've got carbon in, uh, in uh, the soil and you've got emissions from the soil and from the trees when you cut them down. And you've got removals from the atmosphere as the trees grow and soil is sequestered and carbon is sequestered in the soil. And it gets complicated because you, you've got a process that is half natural and half the result of human activity. So you have to work out to what extent is this under our control? And when it is under our control, what are we responsible for? This was a lot easier when you were just trying to work out what was going on with a barrel of oil. So what we need is to keep it simple. And uh, scientists like Piers McLaren from New Zealand Forest Research worked a lot of this out a long time ago. He used to say, if you've got a pit, what does a farmer do if he wants to know the car or she wants to know the carbon balance of their pig? Well, they don't measure all the inputs of food, and breath from the from the into the pig and the outputs from the pig in terms of carbon and work out the balance that way they weigh the pig they weigh it once then they weigh it a few days later and if the pig has put on weight then they know it's a carbon sink and and so don't try to measure all the fluxes in and out just weigh the system periodically and it'll tell you the carbon balance so if we can work out the carbon stock change in a forest we can work out its carbon balance. And this is how it's done. I don't know what happened to the animations. A bit disappointed. Never mind, I can cope. I can cope. 
Um, so we start with the woodland on the left, the tree on the left. You can uh, measure that you can work out the stem volume using basic mensurational techniques. And from that, you can work out the carbon in the stem. You can use allometric relationships to work out the carbon in the other parts of the tree. You can use simple models or direct measurements to work out how much carbon is in the soil. Then you go back five years later and you measure the carbon stock in the system again. And the difference between the two tells you what the carbon stock change is, and that tells you whether you're getting carbon going into the system or coming out of the system, whether your system is a carbon sink or a carbon source. So there are simple ways of simplifying calculating the carbon balance of a quite complicated biological system. And we have models that we use for, that can show you how carbon is accumulated in a stand of trees. Here is an example of a stand of Sitka spruce. It's no thinning to keep it simple. Down here is where you've planted the trees. Here's the establishment phase. The trees grow quite slowly. Then you go into the full vigor phase and then the mature phase. Then you can clear fell and you lose all that carbon again, but you start the second rotation, it starts to accumulate. And you can just leave the trees, in which case you're gonna eventually get to a long-term equilibrium carbon stock. It's important to emphasize here, this act here, this act of establishing the trees on this land, that was entirely under your control. But what happens here is only partially under your control. The trees are going to do their own thing. And there's only so much you can do about it by thinning and, and, uh, and or pruning or uh, tending the trees and making sure they're healthy. So it's only partially under your control. And when you fell the trees, you lose all that carbon stock. You know, should you just retain the trees rather than have this big emission of carbon to the atmosphere? Well, it's a, it, there are different ways of measuring what the carbon impact of creating a woodland is. And these are the different, it's a shame we haven't got the animations here because it would make it easier to follow. Here, for example, are three rotations of that Sitka spruce stand. And this arrow here is telling you what the average increment of the car of, of the stand is over its rotation and you can see it's uh, it's uh, 3.2 tons carbon per hectare is uh, per year is the increment the increment is the rate of carbon uptake by the forest um, but what you also have here is the average carbon stock in the forest which is or the mean carbon stock which is 71 tons carbon per hectare so you've got different measures of how much carbon is in that forest how much it's taking up over one rotation which you then lose again but you can see that you're basically maintaining an average carbon stock on the land that you wouldn't otherwise have if you didn't have that woodland there and that's why it's important to consider the landscape scale because while you might be growing an individual stand and felling an individual stand, and so you're getting big fluctuations in the, and big swings in the quantity of carbon in that one stand, if you have a, if you have a landscape of, of trees and forests, stands all at different stages of development, effectively the differences in the, in the, in, uh, resulting from growth and felling cancel one another out. And that's what that looks like if you establish a whole landscape of trees over a period of time. You effectively have a big increase and then you've effectively created this one off increase in carbon stocks that then just sits there um, because you, you can't really sequester any more carbon in the system because you're then maintaining a constant carbon stock by growing the trees and then felling them. The size of that carbon stock depends on all sorts of things like the species, the growth rate, the rotations, whether you thin or not. It does not result in continuous long-term carbon sequestration, but it might in the soil. If in some circumstances, you might get ongoing carbon sequestration in the soil. You might also get a bit of loss of carbon from the soil. It depends on the system. But this could allow you, while, you make, while you're only main, you're creating this one-off carbon stock and then you, there's no more benefit really, it can allow you to continuously produce carbon neutral timber and biomass. But you need to think about what drives, this is where, could you yeah, have done with the animations, never mind. We need to think what, what drives 
the carbon stocks and carbon dynamics in wood products as opposed to in forest stands. So over here, we, under, that, under that big arrow, unfortunately, was a forest, a cartoon of a forest. forest that doesn't matter if people don't want that product so it's driven by socio-economic drivers rather than biologic the biological potential of the forest to produce the carbon and how much does the wood product contain so that's the other thing that drives carbon dynamics in a wood product the link between the two is how are the trees being managed to produce that carbon and how much wood is can be converted into the product and then how long does the product last in service? Because if the product lasts in service a long time, then you can keep carbon in the forest rather than felling the carbon and transferring it to the wood product. So that's where the link is between what happens in the forest and what happens in the wood products. And the last part of the, of the equation you need to consider is wood product substitution effects. And this is some work done by an old collaborator of ours, Nigel Mortimer from North Energy Associates. I asked him, could you tell me what the carbon impact is of producing a different type of kitchen spoon, either a wooden one, a stainless steel one, or a plastic one? And what you can see here is that the emissions from producing the wooden spoon are orders of an order of magnitude less than the emissions from producing a stainless steel or a plastic spoon. So you've got 96 to no, over 90 percent saving in emissions from producing a wooden spoon compared to a, a, a non wooden spoon. What's that? What does that look like with serious? This is obviously a cartoon to illustrate the point. What does that look like with real numbers? This is um, based on a literature review that was published a couple of years ago, 2018, by the European Forest Institute. You can see the typical emissions displacement factors, as they're called, for different types of wood products. So for structural construction timber, if you have one tonne of carbon in that wood product, it will save you 1.3 tonnes of carbon of emissions from, if, from not building that product out of a non-wood product, a non-wood alternative. Um, you used to see in the literature that it was about two tonnes, but the numbers have come down more recently in the light of better, better research and better information. Um, Non-structural construction is about 1.6. Textiles, this is interesting, 2.8. You can see, but there's not many studies behind that number. You can see that typically the number is you get about slightly more than a ton of emission saved for every ton of carbon in a wood product that you stick in a building or in a piece of furniture or in some other useful item. But there is a risk. What if we said, right, best thing we can do, produce more wood products, isn't it? Well, there's a risk here. Here's a stand of Sitka spruce managed on an 80 year rotation, maybe for landscaping reasons. 
and it's to, we have the we and it's got a mean increment over its rotation of 3.1 tons carbon per hectare per year that you can see that in the red arrow going skywards but you can also see the mean carbon stock it's 115.7 tons carbon per hectare and we've seen how creating a forest gives you a mean carbon stock that you've created and then it just sits there what if we say well wait a minute if we shorten that rotation to the optimum rotation for sitka spruce we can take up more carbon and we can create more wood products because the forest will be more productive because it's on its optimal rotation. So away we go. And what you see is, yes, if you look at that arrow on the right or on the left, you can see it's actually going faster, not much faster, but it's going faster now that you're managing on a shorter rotation. So you're taking up carbon more quickly. You're producing more wood but your mean carbon stock has gone down significantly. When you hear people talk about the carbon debt of wood production or, wood, or of bioenergy, that's what they're talking about. If you mobilize your forests to produce more wood, you run the risk of depleting carbon stocks. For example, younger trees go faster than mature trees, so they can take up carbon more quickly. But by, def by definition, younger trees are smaller, so they contain less carbon per hectare. So that what you have is a one-off debt that you have to pay to mobilize your woodlands and forests to create these products. And that's what you have to watch out for. We've been doing a lot of work on how to manage that sort of problem. Now I'm going to talk about assessment of, for of forest creation options. And this comes from a study called Quantifying the Sustainable Forestry Carbon Cycle, which was commissioned by Scottish Forestry, the Welsh Government and, uh, and uh, Forestry Commission Forest Services. And what we did is we looked at all these different woodland options um, from broadleaves at the top. Oh, don't do that to me. Thank you. So broadleaf options at the top and then coniferous options at the bottom. And uh, they don't actually, re I don't think they relate exactly to the forest development types that were, were mentioned earlier in this, uh, in this meeting, um, because these were selected by the countries, um, by the Scotland, uh, Wales and, North and England, to be woodland options they were interested in creating. And, and you can see we're looking at different types of broadleaves, as I say, and different coniferous options and a couple of uh, mixture options at the bottom. So the results I'm going to present you, um, you'll see stacked bars like this. And this purple bar at the bottom is the emissions from forest operations, generally very small. Then you have carbon sequestered as a result of creating the woodland in the soil. You can also get losses of soil carbon in some cases. Uh, then you have the carbon sequestered in the trees, the creation of that average carbon stock. Then carbon in litter, in the, and in and deadwood and and then the carbon in the wood products that you create from the woodland or the forest and then the emissions you save by using those wood products in place of non-wood alternatives and then the emissions saved by using the the lower value parts of the trees as bioenergy and there's a little bit for biomass cascading at the top biomass cascading being when wood products come into their end of their life you recycle and reuse them and you get a second benefit um, if you don't like, if you don't believe in the substitution benefits of the trees, if you, if you think that's a bit of a red herring, you can just ignore those parts of the graphs and just look at the green parts, which is what happens in the forest. So there you are. After if you planted these woodlands in 2022, what would you get by 2050 over that period? And here you have oh, you have the broadleaf options, the coniferous options a very fast growing Sitka spruce plantation and these mixture options. And what I think you can see is they're all pretty good, but actually there's some quite interesting stuff going on. You've actually got losses of soil carbon initially in many of these options, but that's more than compensated for in most of the options by carbon sequestered in the trees. It's important to mention that the countries didn't, these are not wanted these to not be pure options. They wanted them to be consistent with the UK forestry standards. So even the coniferous options can include areas of broadleaf woodland. So they're not absolutely pure, 
but the labels tell you what the different options are emphasizing. So that's over a relatively short period out to 2050. And there's the sensitivity analysis, and this is quite important. This is just looking at little variations in growth rate and other parameters in the modeling to see how sensitive the results are. And what you can, and I can put this green line through here, and you can see that all of these options actually go through this green line. The only option that op options that are actually coming out best over the shorter period are these fast growing coniferous options. They're sticking out in the shorter term, but pretty much everything else is delivering a similar level of carbon sequestration and carbon benefits. If you look over the longer term, I won't dwell on this, but what you can see is that the results do tend on the time interval, because obviously the further you go out, the closer you're getting to that long-term carbon stock, where at which point you don't get any additional carbon benefit from sequestering carbon in trees. You might get some in soil and you might get some in the wood products. So you can see here, for example, that the soil carbon is generally sequestering, though in soil, we're generally sequestering carbon if we look over longer periods, we're not losing it anymore. Um, and when we look at the sensitivity analysis, you can see even the fast growing Sitka spruce is now down with the others at the, at the lower extreme. And I think this is important all forestry options can give you climate benefits. If you like naturally regenerated broadleaves, fine. If you like fast growing conifers for timber, fine. They all give you benefits. Stop arguing over whether conifers or broadleaves are better. I am, you know, I've seen these results used by the industry to insist that fast that this means fast growing conifers are the, are the only way to go. I've seen the lobbyists for for naturally regenerated broadleaves use the same evidence to make to, to argue for their position. Please stop twisting the evidence. Um, so there are the findings. I've already told you what the findings are, so I'm not going to dwell on that. You can read those slides later. I'm now going to talk a little bit about assessing management options for existing forests. And to do this, um, this work was done actually for the Dutch government. It's gonna be in a report published quite soon. How would you go about taking a forest, a big forest that you've got and working out how you could manage it to for carbon benefits? Well, I'm suggesting you could use this process. Divide the forest up into uniform forest units. And then for each forest unit, you could characterize how long, how the unit is being managed now, and you could calculate the mean carbon stock per hectare in the trees for that type of management. And I've shown you how to do that. You've seen all those graphs. You can use the models to work out those average carbon stocks for different combinations of species, growth rate and management. Then you multiply the area of that forest unit by that mean carbon stock, and that tells you the average carbon stock or the total carbon stock in that area of forest unit. Then you add up the carbon stocks for all the forest units and you get the total carbon stocks in your forest in terms of a long term average. And then you repeat that, you repeat that process for how you're planning to manage the forest in the future. Maybe you're going to introduce continuous cover forestry more. Maybe you're going to introduce areas of conservation for higher carbon stocks. Maybe you're going to mobilize some areas to produce more wood for substitution benefits. So you build that in, you repeat that, and you get a new carbon stock. And the carbon impact of your management decisions is then simply the difference between the carbon stock before you introduce the management as you calculated it and the carbon stock afterwards. It isn't that difficult, is it? And this is how you do it, for example. Here on the left is a stand of thin Scots pine. There, and you know, we could calculate, we have calculated these numbers, we've done this. We've got a big table of these mean carbon stocks. So here's the mean carbon stock for some yield class four Scots pine being managed and for, by thinning and felling for wood production and by some silver cultural technique we managed to push it up to yield class six. So we get a tiny little benefit in the carbon stock and we can claim that little carbon benefit and we can put that into our calculations. So, that, so all you need is the mean two mean carbon stocks and you compare them to get the benefit of this particular management option. Where in other situations, you're gonna get a carbon debt and you can also calculate that as well. 
So what we can do is then take our forest landscape, which you can see up here. And now yeah, it's there. We've, got, we've got a map of all our forest units. We can work out what the forest units are. We can characterize what the difference in management is going to be. And then we do the calculations here. And lo and behold, while some are going down in carbon stocks, some are going up. These ones that are going down are generally giving you more wood production. We don't allow for that in these calculations. The crucial thing is that number at the bottom there is positive. The overall impact at the landscape scale of your management is positive in terms of long-term carbon stocks. Everybody wins. And not shown in this calculation, you're producing more wood, which is giving you the substitution benefits. So I think we're not very far off being able to have a framework for managing existing woodlands to, to ensure that we, we, we maintain carbon stocks and produce useful renewable timber and bioenergy. So in conclusion, the science is relatively simple. There are some other effects that I haven't gone into, like albedo and certain biophysical effects. I personally don't think they change the story I've shown you. There are lots of changes. There are lots of options for creating new forests. Please don't get caught up on one option. Literally, it's right tree, right place, right time, like uh, Chris Reynolds said. So my apologies for that. <laughs> it, it is best to focus on the other motives for creating the forest. And if you do that, the carbon will look after itself. But bear in mind, you'll get carbon sequestration initially, but eventually it will saturate. And then it's really a case of what benefits you're getting from producing low emissions and timber from low emissions timber and biomass in the long term. So planning and implementing the management of this can involve challenges and trade-offs, but I think I've illustrated how it is possible. And I think a simple practical framework might help with this. And I'm gonna end very quickly by showing you some tools that are either already available or are emerging for you to do this kind of management. I'm gonna go very quickly because I'm guessing I'm running out of time. Yeah. All right. OK. Well, then I won't. You got you got more. I've got you. You've got I've got your attention for longer. It's more the power. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, Joe Strummer. Joe Strummer was sitting around a campfire with his mates, probably smoking something at Glastonbury Festival in 1996. He came up with a great idea, man. He was a punk, but I'm for some reason I'm imagining him as a hippie. I don't know why. Maybe he was a hippie in a raincoat. I don't know. Why don't you get people to pay to plant trees to offset their carbon dioxide emissions? So for those people who hate carbon, carbon offsetting schemes, you can blame Joe Strummer. Because that led to one of the first examples of a commercial carbon offsetting scheme. This went on and it got, became a bit of a wild, wild west of carbon trading. So what the Forestry Commission did in the 2000s was come up with the Woodland Carbon Code to try to bring order and reliability and credibility to, carbon, to, 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 to the carbon market for creating woodlands to offset CO2 emissions. I don't know that they were exactly fans of carbon trading or carbon offsetting, but they said, well, if you're going to do it, you should at least do it credibly. And here's how to do it. And the Woodland Carbon Code, which you can find online still, provides you with some of the tools you can use to do that, including this spreadsheet system, which tells you the carbon sequestered in different types of woodland options over time. Please. Don't misuse those in the way I've described some lobbyists do. Um, we can also come up with guidance like this. This was something that was produced as part of the report for that project I mentioned, quantifying the forest sustainable forestry carbon cycle. This is a sort of an assessment of the loss of carbon stocks you would get on different soil types as a result of creating woodland using different ground preparation techniques. So you've got different soil types down here as rows, and you've got different ground preparations across here as columns. And it's basically quantifying how big a carbon debt you would get initially from losing soil carbon. Bear in mind, you will recover that soil carbon eventually in many of these cases, but this is the initial loss. And what, where, what it's showing you is effectively where the best options are for minimizing soil carbon losses 
in terms of linking soil types to ground preparation techniques. Now, one needs to be very careful with stuff like this because this is the sort of stuff that requires consultation with the countries and with stakeholders before you release it. And this is this is only what we came up with. So I must attach a major health warning to this. It's not official. This is just our best guess at the moment. But I think this is, could form a framework for helping with wood and creation, ensuring we aren't causing major carbon, soil carbon losses in the short term as part of woodland creation. Then there's this um, there's the holy grail of so-called climate smart forestry. Well, what does that mean? Well, the European Forest Institute have published a report again about the potential for European forests to sequester carbon or, or avoid emissions through use of harvested wood. You can probably, if you go onto the European Forest Institute website, I'm sure you can find the report. But the authors who produced that report tried to summarize what climate smart forestry might look like with, wait for it, a four-cornered triangle. So you've got four corners. Up here, you're emphasizing the protection of forests for high carbon stocks. Here, you're emphasizing restoring landscapes by, by protecting and restoring damaged forests and woodland creation. Here, you're managing your woodlands to produce timber to, to avoid to enable you to substitute for uh, non-renewable products. Uh, oh, sorry. You, this and, and here is how you use the wood to ensure that you get those substitution benefits. And some of this is sort of a no-brainer. It's a pristine primary forest with high carbon stocks. Protect it. Duh. Um, but. Uh, uh, some of the options are less obvious, and it's these in the middle here, which is where they've tried to say, well, where is the emphasis fall for different types of forest in terms of whether you protect, you restore, or you manage? We turned the, uh, that you remember I showed you how you could have this uh, system with average carbon stocks for, um, for um, estimating what the impact of managing your existing woodlands would be. We turned it into a game. We actually played this at the Con4 show. Some of you may have seen it. You may see it at the Royal Welsh show if you come this year, and you can come and play the game and join in. But basically, we had a simple map of two forest compart or two areas, one an existing compartment, and one is a new area you could plant. And you, it's a card game. The dealer tells you what woodland you've got. In this case, it's, uh, it's uh, I can't see, it's Norway spruce. It's your class 10. So you're dealt that card and then you decide, what am I going to do to try to increase the card and benefits? And here the player has dealt the card. I'm going to convert it to continuous cover management. And then you've got this area here where you can create a woodland. And what you're trying to do is maximize your carbon benefits. And uh, so it's a nice little game you can play that illustrates the principles. But you could turn that game into a real tool. You really could. And so to conclude with a few issues. Bear in mind when you do any of this that carbon sequestration is reversible. So if you create forests with the aim of increasing carbon stocks on an area of land, you have locked future generations into maintaining that carbon stock. Because if they then decide to use that land for something different, it, they are going to emit the carbon by losing those carbon stocks. So you're forcing them to protect those woodlands that you've created. Now, they can, of course, remove the woodlands. It's their choice. But then if they want to balance their carbon budgets, they then have a challenge for how they do that because they've had to remove your forest. How do they then compensate for the loss of carbon stocks? How do you ensure that wood products give you those greenhouse gas emissions savings? You know, those orange parts of those uh, those bars that you saw. Does it really happen? Well, how do you do that? You need joined up cross-sectoral policies, what the European Commission, I think, call environmental integrity. Um, pay now to get, you, you pay now, you have to put a lot of investment in, money in, but the benefits are quite long-term. You don't get them initially. You might even get some losses of soil carbon initially. So there's an investment here 
and it's like you only get the benefits later on, and that can be a problem in terms of incentivizing these issues. The environmental and social benefits can be difficult to monetize because carbon prices can be very volatile. For example, I was talking this morning about how we were involved in carbon projects. We were helping support some carbon management projects in existing forests in the late 2000s, and these projects were going to fly. It was great news. Then we had the economic crisis. The bottom fell out of the carbon market and everything ended overnight. So there are issues there. How do we ensure stability? And then whose carbon is it anyway? In the forests, you, if you've got a forest, you don't own the carbon in that forest. The government owns the carbon because the government claims that carbon as part of what it reports to the United Nations framework, the Convention on Climate Change. So how do we, how do we work out who owns carbon? And then when you sell carbon in a wood product, who owns the carbon in the wood product? Well, that's a tricky one. Um, and we need no regrets action, risk management along the lines that I guess Gail and Gail was talking about this morning, my colleague Gail Atkinson. And please mind your language. Terminology is complicated uh, and you need to use it very precisely. Um, carbon sequestrate, well, carbon storage is a classic example. Carbon storage can mean carbon being removed from the atmosphere as a process, or it can just mean carbon that's already there being retained. So language in this field is really important, particularly when you're doing international negotiations. It's legal. So uh, when someone says, we're going to store this much carbon, does that mean they've already got the carbon and they don't need to do anything? Or is it new carbon that they're going to remove from the atmosphere? You have to watch out for that sort of stuff. Finally, beware of simplistic arguments and positions. The issue of climate change and how to solve it is too big for sectoral self-interest. And I would appeal to everyone to bear that in mind when they're thinking about advocating for particular forestry options. Most importantly of all, ladies and gentlemen, act now. Thank you. Yeah, um, so, so we, we go one question from the lane. Um, Melanie, sorry, uh, what's the reference for this study presented on slide 20? Slide 20. Sorry to interject. It's a, it's a, it, well, it's relevant to many of your slides, but um, I particularly noticed it was the study you were talking about where you were looking at talking through all these results. Oh, this is quantifying the sustainable forestry carbon cycle. Yeah. Yeah. It's on the Forest Research website, and I, in fact, if, if I can, well, first of all, we can, I'm sure I can provide a link to the organisers before we finish today. But I suspect if you Google forest research quantifying the sustainable forestry carbon cycle, it should come up. Thank you very much. Pleasure. And no. Just to add to that, the Dutch government report that I mentioned, um, hopefully that will be coming out in the next few months. Thank you, Robert. Um, very enjoyable presentation as always and on time, um, which is unusual. <laughs> What, um, me? Moi? <laughs> um, you've got an audience in front of you today, and I'm sure you've 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 shared this presentation with many others. But I'd be interested to get your views on how this type of presentation and the work you've done on modelling, particularly carbon modelling, has been picked up and interpreted by policymakers in Scotland, England, and Wales. We're in the middle of a general election. Um, 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 uh, Trevor, and I'm not sure I can say much of that other than 
Um, generally, I don't find that the departments representing the government are, are unreasonable, that they generally seem to to take, you know, it is evidence-led evidence um, um, policy. It's more the non-governmental organizations that are a problem. Um, um, and, and I can sympathize with what they do. So CONFOR obviously are there to, to further the interests of the forest industries. It, it's a perfectly legitimate um, project for them to have. I just wish they were a little bit more measured in how they interpret the results of this study and others, um, because they do tend to emphasize the, the, the fast growing Sitka spruce or fast growing conifer option. And you can see in the short term, it is a great option, but it's, uh, it, it's it, but I think what we see is if we look over the longer term, many of these options have benefits and it is, it's, you know, the, la the last thing we need to do is put all our eggs in one basket. I think what this, I know we had a meeting of the European Forest Institute in Aberdeen in 2019, just before the lockdown. And uh, Joe O'Hara was there talking about uh, the color palette that is available to foresters and landowners to create different types of forest. And I thought that was a good analogy. What I think these results do is show you that color palette, all those options in the color palette give you carbon benefits. And, it's a, and so you can look at other reasons why you want to create the forests rather than focusing on one option. There are examples, I think, of misuse of the results, though. And one particular case was the Royal Society of Edinburgh, who took this amongst other pieces of evidence and claimed this was compellingly showing that simply allowing areas to naturally regenerate with native broadleaves was the, the clearly the best option. And I think from the results you've seen me present here, I cannot understand how they came to that conclusion based on this evidence. Um, and I think that was rather disappointing. Hi there. It can be challenging to plant trees in Wales. There's a lot of opposition from farmers. Um, they say about um, grassland storage, permanent pasture storage is um, equitable to planting trees. There's often challenges from conservationists saying priority habitats and semi-natural um, grassland is more important than planting trees. Um, and it's really difficult to get the argument passed about, you know, the right tree in the right place for a number of benefits. But um, I don't know how we can work together to get these messages out. I think everybody in this room does that already, but it's it's really getting to perhaps the farming unions or perhaps the conservationists that trees are good and they, you know, working together. So I don't know if you have any advice on that. Um, well, we were, uh, so we were talking earlier about a briefing note that has been produced by um, a, a consortium of researchers doing policy work for Wales. Um, this this comes under the uh, the badge EREMP, not the greatest of acronyms, but it's bloody good work. EREMP is spelled E R A M -M, M P, and it's led by Professor Bridget Emmett at the Centre of Ecology and Hydrology. So I think they're just literally C E H U K these days. Um, so, and she's based in Bangor. And that briefing note talks about the quantity of carbon in different ecosystems and the carbon sequestration that you get on different um, um, ecosystem types, including grassland and forests. I felt that was a useful synthesis of the evidence. Um, it's been suggested to me that evidence was presented selectively. Well, I'm open to hear what the missing evidence is. Um, and, and I, 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 you know, I, because we don't, we don't want to miss any evidence out. But, but I would say, when you look at the evidence available, it, you need to interpret it very carefully. For example, I did find one scientific study that showed that creating a certain type of forest on a certain type of land led to net loss of carbon overall, particularly if you looked at a short period. 
but um, this was a particular type of soil and the forest was about yield class one and a half. So, you know, bear in mind a typical broadleaf forest might be your class four or six normally, or a coniferous forest up to 12 or more. So, you know, it was a very specific case and people, were, and yet the scientists were presenting this as here, look, woodland creation is bad. Now, there is, a, there is a responsibility on the research community and on the part of lobbyists, I think, to be objective and impartial in their presentation of evidence. If people are going to twist evidence, there's not much we can do about it. Robert, thank you so much for outstanding explanation of some very complex issues. I'd like to pick up your issue on timescales. As a forest ecologist, I'm all in favour of thinking very much into the long term. But is there a case in climate policy terms on the optimistic assumption that we will have achieved more avoidance of emissions and mitigation of them by 2050 um, to suggest that the role of sequestration measures like forestry is most important in the short term until we reach that nirvana of carbon capture and storage and goodness knows what else, in which case of the two timescales you presented, isn't there a, a case for the policy emphasis to be more on the shorter term of those two timescales? I think, I think the, what the evidence shows us is the need for Oh, this could be seen as policy prescriptive. Oh, what the hell? Um, I think it, what it what it needs is a plan. So it, 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 yes, you're going to need short term sequestration. You're also going to need long term consolidation of carbon stocks. So you need a plan. You need a basket of measures. It's not about one measure. You need a basket of measures and they need to work together to give you the, both the short-term and the long-term outcomes that you want. Um, yeah, I'm um, uh, Roger Moore, um, Senior Research Entomologist at Forest Research Northern Research Station. These days, though, I think the senior refers more to my age than anything else. Um, and uh, I'm going to be talking today about hylobius management. Um, I know this is uh, quite an issue that everybody's interested in. Um, uh, currently, um, I've uh, been involved with um, hylobius and hylobius work now for over 30 years for my sins, um, and have pretty much covered every area of uh, work on hylobius. So. Uh, plant protection, which I'll go into uh, quite a, quite a bit today, um, uh, invoking or, or um, uh, looking at fallow periods, developing the hylobius management support system and other monitoring systems, uh, and also um, well, starting to um, delve into biological control. Um, I should say Hylobius and large pine weevil are probably uh, used interchangeably today. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, this is just uh, really an overview of the sort of things that uh, forest research do. Um, and obviously you've heard quite a lot about this already. So I thought it'd be quite a, a useful slide to every, for everybody to have in. Um, but basically, FR, obviously, as most of you all know, is um, GB's principal organisation for forestry and tree related research. Um, and my remit um, isn't just Scotland, it's Scotland, England, Wales. Um, so uh, a lot of the high lobbyist work that I do as we're based at, uh, as I'm based in uh, Edinburgh is in Scotland. But I've also done quite a bit of work in England and Wales as well. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> yeah, so a quick introduction to the Northern Research Station entomology team. Um, there's eight of us in total, um, and at least five of us are involved with uh, Hylobius uh, work to various degrees. I'm spending a 
a whole lot of my time currently writing up a lot of the work that I've done in the past on Hylabius. There's quite a bit to do after 30 years of uh, study of Hylabius, but also other members of my team, Katie Dainton, Catherine Lester, uh, Sonia and Steinker and Molly Davidson are also involved to various degrees in that research as well, but other studies on insect um, pest problems as well. Next slide, please. Yeah, so a quick introduction uh, to Hylobius and large, large pine weevil. Um, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with it because it's the number one restocking uh, pest of forestry. Uh, first thing to say probably is that it's a native UK pest uh, and also find, found quite widely across uh, the, pretty much the whole of Europe as well. Uh, so very widespread in distribution. Uh, it's the adults that cause the problems, really, because um, they emerge to feed on um, saplings that uh, uh, have been planted to restock sites, and they represent a, a risk, really, to restock trees for anything up to uh, five or six years post felling. Um, and they'll cause tree damage, um, sometimes very excessive tree damage and mortality. Um, so they're a serious problem um, to everybody involved with, re with restocking, really. Um, it's probably worth mentioning that the immatures, the eggs, the larvae uh, and the pupae themselves are non-damaging. But of course, if you've got those immature stages, which are in the stumps, um, then at some stage they are going to emerge as adults and they are going to cause damage. Um, and it's it's a really significant problem uh, in commercial forestry, causing um, somewhere in the region, in terms of management anyway, of four to eight million pounds worth of damage per year in the UK. Um, and figures are much higher for the rest of, of Europe as well. But that's really just taking into account the management costs. There are other potential costs of things like delayed revenue if you go for extended fallow periods, for example. Um, so it can mount up to somewhere in the region of um, 20 to 40 million pounds worth a year. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> um, yeah, so this is the, the life cycle of the insect and why it's become a forest management problem. Um, as I've just mentioned, it, it actually breeds in uh, stumps, conifer stumps, not not uh, broadleaf stumps at all, but in pretty much any conifer stump, um, Hylobius can breed in as a as a breeding resource. Um, and we've created this. This is a man-made problem essentially um, because of the fact we're highly efficient in terms of felling trees. So all of a sudden, uh, we get huge numbers of stumps all available at the same time or nearly the same time but uh, in very short in a very short time frame and those stumps release volatiles uh, things like alpha pinene decomposition products like ethanols um, but the adult insect is very efficient at detecting those volatiles using the antenna um, at the base of its uh, rostrum um, and it uses odour plumes coming away from those spelled stumps and navigates its way up the odour stream to find the um, the stumps to breed in and it's really almost using that like a those compounds like a pheromone to find that resource um, and on site the males and females will mate and they'll then lay eggs in the stumps and the eggs are laid below the soil surface um, and um, very soon after um, the flight period so the flight periods are taking place in may uh, and june into the early part of july mating is um, very quick after they've arrived on site and they'll then they'll lay their eggs. The eggs take probably about two weeks to complete their development. They'll then emerge as larvae. Uh, the larval development cycle is extremely long. They'll emerge as 
very small first install RV uh, between probably two and four millimeters maybe and they'll they'll go right up to a fifth install um, which is roughly a centimeter perhaps a little bit over that um, but that larval development will take around about 15 months to complete so if you're following that um, the line going around in a circle there if you start off in the spring in the uh, inside line, you'll see just how long it's taking them to complete development. Um, the larvae then turn to the pupae, um, which is the image just under larval development there. Uh, the pupae, once they form the pupae, they will emerge as adults and the pupae, pupal stage lasts um, around about two weeks again before adult emergence. Um, the adults that emerge are emerging from sites that are actually getting quite old at that stage. So they're looking for themselves as, as new offspring adults to actually fly to fresher sites to lay their eggs in. Um, and they're very, very strong flyers. They can fly for between uh, one and 20 kilometers. Um, and they, because of this ability to find new resources, breeding resources, they're very, very capable um, of doing that and will colonize new sites, new clear bell sites in very large numbers. And of course, if we've planted the trees up um, on the site, um, the adults will will uh, eat them and can potentially ring and bark them and kill the trees. Next uh, image, please. Yeah, so <clears throat> this sort of explains a little bit about um, why it's a pest, as I mentioned in the earlier slide as well. Um, it, the uh, immature stage is breeding in conifer sumps. Um, generally speaking, there's between no um, immatures and 120 uh, maximum that we found in uh, stumps. And uh, that's the number of adults that can emerge per stump. They feed on saplings. Um, if we've got, for example, a clear fall of 700 stumps per hectare, we can get an average emergence of somewhere in the region of 21,000 uh, weevils per hectare. Um, but it tends to range between two and 84,000 or so insects per hectare at any point in time. And a single insect can actually kill the tree. Um, and that's, I guess, is why it's claiming why they cause such uh, heavy damage and why the trees uh, in particular need protection. Um, UK populations are very high. I've done studies in uh, Sweden as, uh, as well, and their populations were significantly lower than ours. So um, uh, it's, it contrasts with Europe um, in terms of the techniques that might be um, useful for, for management and control. Um, it's particularly abundant in, in some areas. It depends on the abundance of breeding material. Um, you know, if you've got continuous felling of conifers, uh, contiguous felling of conifers, uh, increased storm damage, that tends to exacerbate the populations. They increase in numbers and you'll see more damage. Um, proximity of clear fells right next to each other when insects are emerging and they can easily make it to another site also contributes to um, rapid increases in populations and damage. Now the way things are at the moment and it has been the situation obviously for a long time is that we're heavily reliant in insecticides um, so we're using plant protection um, tend to be using plant protection rather than uh, population control at the moment, but we're trying to shift away from that. So in terms of plant protection, mainly using insecticides, but also using um, barriers and things. So I'll show some images of those. Sorry, yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, so in terms of the management history, it's uh, Hylobius has been a problem for over a hundred years now. And the, the problem has gradually got worse as we've become more and more efficient in terms of felling trees. Um, in the early years, there was some knowledge about fallow. Um, so occasionally that was used. Um, there was also uh, some mass trapping, uh, hand picking of weevils off trees, all sorts of things that we wouldn't even consider now. And I shan't ask for a show of hands as to 
who's actually done that because I can imagine the response. But anyway, um, we've been heavily reliant on insecticides um, right from the 1960s. Um, and we've used a whole range of chemicals during that time, DDT, Lindane, permethrin, Cypermethrin, Forrester. Uh, but myself and my colleague Ian Willoughby have done an awful lot of work in looking at um, bringing forward new insecticides as we've lost our previous insecticides. And we've also uh, been looking at physical barriers and coatings and things as well. Um, to determine how useful they'll be in forestry at protecting the the, um, the reed plants. But it doesn't really matter. Um, well, I say it doesn't really matter. You can still get large amounts of damage regardless of the amount of chemical that you put on the site and that you can still get mortality. And the reason for that is the insecticides are protecting the tree but it doesn't take the weevil, it doesn't stop the weevils taking exploratory bites. And if the population's high enough and you've got enough of those exploratory bites, you can still get trees damaged and killed. Um, you can see on this picture here, well, hopefully you can see on this picture here, that's a tree protected by um, acetamiprid. And th there's a whole pile of weevils here that have taken enough bites to kill them. But that isn't always the case, and that's quite an unusual sight, actually. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm sure most of you who are involved with the restocking will want to know what the current insecticide situation is, um, especially with uh, gazelle, acetamiprid. Um, and you'll probably know that HSE CRD refused re uh, start again reapproval in January of 2013 three for the use in forests and forest nurseries um, and we have to use uh, the final top-up sprays uh, spring 2024 or carry them out in spring 2024 and use up all the products and dispose of the product by July 2024. Um, what I can say is the, the approval holders understandably Certius Bolchim are committed to reapplying for extensions of authorization for minor use at EMUs um, to cover the use in forest nurseries on tree crop production before lifting. Um, that uh, has been submitted um, and uh, FR and CONFOR have been working very hard on this, uh, principally Ian Willoughby, who I mentioned earlier, but myself and my colleagues at NRS have been contributing to that as well. Uh, so it's submitted, not heard yet as to what the result of that will be. Um, use on lifted trees, um, essentially pre-planting, pre-treatment is being worked on at the moment and use in the forest, a reapplication for use in the forest for top up spraying that's currently being worked on at the moment as well. So this is all in process. Um, no approvals yet for Gazelle, but we're working very hard on behalf of the forest industry to support those applications for approvals. Um, next slide, please. So what are the other options if we haven't got gazelle? Um, another uh, insecticide that um, I found was really good in trials that I did was chlorantraniliprol, which is, uh, well, uh, Corrigen. Um, we put in two extensions of authorization for minor use for that. Um, Cypermethrin, which is sort of I suppose going going back, so it's sort of a retrograde step in terms of what you might be able to use to protect the plants. There's still full on label approval until 2031 for use as a top up spray in the forest for cypermethrin. Um, there's no approval for use as a pre planting pre treatment. Um, so. At the moment, we're quite limited in terms of control and we don't really want to be taking the retrograde retrograde step, I suppose, of going back to cypermethrin um, because of the issues with the aquatic toxicity. Um, but nonetheless, it, it is still potentially uh, something that we can use. Um, next slide, please. 
Uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, something else that obviously we may be familiar with to some degree in terms of uh, plant protection from hylobius is using physical protection. And what I mean with that is using tree shelters of some kind, like multi pro sleeves, bio sleeves, and we nets, um, and also coatings, things like KVAA, E wax, um, flex coat, and coniflex. And once again, like the insecticides, they're not really controlling the population, it's just plant protection, stopping the insect getting to the tree to feed on it, cause damage, and kill them. Um, that tends to be more successful elsewhere in Europe where population pressure is lower, but the studies, the trials that I did here showed that they they did reduce damage, um, but not to the same degree as insecticides, and we would only really advocate them being used where we know what the population is, and I'll tell you how you do that in a minute, um, and the population's pressures are, are medium to low from Hylobius. Uh, it can give you that little bit of extra protection that you wouldn't get uh, without using them. But of course, they're expensive. The issues that we find are that the uh, coatings and things crack, they split, um, the barriers blow over, they can be too loose and the Hylobius can get in around the barrier. They impact tree growth. Um, and there's also application and storage issues for nursery and, and planting. So it makes the planting process, generally speaking, less efficient. Uh, so what are the other alternatives um, other than the, the more familiar ones? Next slide, please. Yeah, so I thought I'd draw your attention um, to this particular document that myself and, and Ian Willoughby produced about the integrated management of Hylobius in UK forestry. Uh, hopefully there's still links on uh, to this on the Forest Research website. I can probably send those through so that it can be circulated. Um, so integrated pest management is, as it says, it's looking at a whole range of uh, potential techniques to try and mitigate the problem with Hylobius. Um, so there's all sorts of options, obviously, open to us, take no action. So in other words, just ignore the problem uh, and hope it goes away. Uh, not one we'd recommend. Um, avoid the problem altogether, maybe planting a different tree species, as we've already heard about today, um, but also things like uh, fallow are helping us to avoid the problem as well. Um, or take some kind of a remedial action. Um, and there's really two of those, um, either the chemical method, um, which this guide will tell you isn't the preferred option, um, although we're still predominantly using that, um, but they're also using non-chemical methods. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, so it, it's really trying to suggest that you go for an integrated approach, understand what the problem is um, and try to um, mitigate the issues. Um, sorry, next slide, please. Yeah, so in terms of monitoring for Hylobius as a problem, you can do ad, height, ad hoc site checks, but they're quite expensive in terms of staff costs. You get access timing issues and they're sort of subjective. They rely very much on an individual forester's own experiences, which is a good thing if you know your area well, but it's not always reliable. Um, I won't explain the reasons for that, but it's not all re always reliable. I would always try to push you towards FR's Hylobius Management Support System, and that's something I developed uh, with some of my colleagues at NRS uh, based on a really detailed um, studies of Hylobius population dynamics, understanding how the insect behaves from the time of felling to five years post felling. And there's a yeah, there's a very consistent cycle there, but populations on individual sites can vary dramatically both between sites and even on the same site as the Hylobius goes through its developmental cycle. There are periods of emergence and there are periods of low population on the same site. So that really needs to be understood. And the only way to do that really is to feed in 
uh, billet counts, which can be collected over a four week period prior to planting. And by using those empirical counts of population size, you can, we can then, using the models that are inbuilt into the system, forecast weevil damage into the future. And it enables you to select management options that um, are tailored to your site and your size populations. It's actually quite a low cost system, um, costing between three, three pound fifty and seven pounds per hectare, depending on the number of sites you're monitoring. Um, the other method that's come in quite recently is using spotter pods, which are um, essentially remote monitoring as well, uh, automated. Um, they measure the populations every so often. Um, well, it's more activity than populations, really, uh, but it's not linked to damage. So you'll only be able to see what the population is at a point in time, um, which isn't always a useful tool for management because you want to be planning your management, and that's what the high use management support system will do for you. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, so there's a couple of the um, actions that um, I discussed in the High Lobius Integrated Forest Management Strategy document. Take no action, as I mentioned before, high risk, and it possibly you'll get up to 100% losses of your trees without doing anything at all. Um, avoid the problem, so it might be alternative silvicultural systems like CCF. I did quite a little bit of work on that. Uh, previously, and you find that in CCF, damage levels tend to be lower because the high lobius will go on to uh, trees, standing trees, large trees within the CCF um, system and cause damage there rather than on the restocked trees. So that can really reduce damage. Um, the problem with that, of course, is you get a higher wind risk on some sites. Um, you can put in an alternative species, broad leaves. It'll damage them, but it won't breed in them. It won't breed in the stumps. But of course, that's not suitable on all sites. Um, next um, slide, please. So this is another way of avoiding uh, damage, the fallow strategy. By fallow, I mean they leave the site for a number of years after it's been felled to enable hylobius to colonise but for the numbers to go down. And in terms of the fallow strategy, we would suggest that you leave the site unplanted for three to five years. If you're planting at three years, you'll probably still need to use treated trees. If you leave it for longer than five, um, you know, there's less need to use treated trees because the population has gone through its cycle, the stumps are dry, or almost all the emergence has, has taken place as well. Um, the issues with leaving fallow is that you can get weevils migrating from other clear fells. Um, and although it says one kilogram uh, kil kilometer separation distance required there, in actual fact, if the weevils are just walking from um, an old site where they've been developing to a new site that you're starting to manage, in actual fact, you can leave um, 25 to 50 metres because they won't walk that distance. So you might need a boundary strip that you treat with insecticides, but beyond that boundary, you can probably get away with it, with um, not treating them on older sites. Uh, you get impacts of fallow on watercourses, nitrate releases, phosphate leaching flood risks. So it obviously has those drawbacks. Um, vegetation growth. The longer you leave it, the more um, herbicide you probably need to use. Wind throw risk of um, fallow as well to adjacent blocks and reductions in timber production, revenues and carbon sequestration. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so other ways of mitigating the problem, which aren't as good, but they can contribute to an I, I, um Integrated Pest Management Strategy, IPM, is things like ground preparation and planting stock. So mounding sites, scraping to expose mineral soil surrounding the saplings can reduce damage to some extent. It's not uh, the greatest, but it, it'll help. Uh, leave woody vegetation altern as alternative food sources, and that includes um, regrowth as well. Um, 
Uh, it's not reliable in high population uh, situations, but maybe in low, it will help um, mitigate the issues. Uh, there are, of course, issues with soil erosion by doing that and leaching. Um, planting stock, the larger root collar you have on the planting stock, the more likely it is to be able to resist damage and survive. The more vigorous the saplings are and the more robust, the better. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, well, in terms of remedial action, you need to really to um, control the population. Um, so things like, and Wales has been very good at, the, at using remedial action for a number of years now. So things like biological control using entomopathogenic nematodes, carrying out stump applications of nematode solutions during June, July. Um, the weevil population is then reduced because the nematodes uh, infect the larvae, as you can see there, there's a stump and two larvae there. The nematodes go in through the mouth parts and the spiracles of the larvae into the body cavity. The nematodes release a pellet of bacteria which causes septicemia in, in the immature insect and kills it before they emerge. Um, so there's been a, a good level of success in Wales uh, using that, but it's not used widely anywhere else. The issues with it are that there's large water volumes are required, that you get higher success on pine than spruce with a greater amount of mortality of the larvae in pine than spruce. Um, pine, it can be above 80%. Uh, spruce, it tends to be 25 to 20% mortality. Uh, it's impractical on remote sites, steep or soft ground sites, and we're actually thinking about trialing uh, drone applications of biocontrols uh, currently. So hopefully I'll have more detail on that in the future. Um, but you can still get weevil migrations from nearby sites, but that doesn't tend to take place um, to the same degree um, as um, well, yeah, I wouldn't be too worried about it, but it can occur. Next slide, please. Uh, stump removal, that's always a possibility in mulching. It essentially is removing the breeding material from site, the stumps. Uh, it will reduce uh, weevil populations, but it has to be done at the right time. And prior to first emergence, the issue with that higher energy labour you know, requirements, site disturbance, obviously, and environmental risks. Um, I'm sure uh, Robert uh, may have something to say about that as well, and any um, remaining uh, breeding materials, such as the roots that are broken off, are still breeding material for hylobius. So it won't totally eradicate the problem, and it's not something we'd rec strongly recommend at all. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so a summary of the current options. Um, I would always push everybody to understand um, the size of the population on their clear fell that they're dealing with by monitoring sites and Hylobius management support system is the best way of doing that because it predicts damage into the future, which other systems don't do. Um, use a combination of alternative management methods, fallow, planting stock, you can obviously combine these uh, nematodes as well where possible. Um, again, reiterating, it's the last chance to use a Cetamoprid, uh, Gazelle SG. Uh, we're working on off-label approvals, um, seeking approval for pre-treatments and top-up spray, and we're doing that for both uh, Gazelle, Cetamoprid, Chlorum and Chlorantraniliprol. Sorry, I always struggle with that word. Um, that Chlorantraniliprol, Nearly pole, no, pole. <laughs> it is effective, but it's expensive and it's double the cost of gazelle. So, um, yeah, that's something to consider as well. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, so we don't really want to go back to cypermethrin if we can avoid it, but nonetheless, it is still an option. Next slide, please. Yeah, so my main aim and the main aim of my colleagues is really um, IPM um, and 
predominantly now we're trying to push more and more towards biological control because it reduces the weevil populations but we need to reduce those perhaps below half of the current levels for it to be effective um, it should allow restocking without uh, pesticides if it's as effective as we hope it will be um, but it may still need to be used in conjunction with pesticides to some degree as well and also physical barriers um, and of course um, yeah because we're developing that it's not necessarily other than nematodes it's not something that we can necessarily transfer immediately to um, another one of my colleagues um Cap, uh, Tubby is working on um heteropisidium butt rot to reduce um uh, populations in the stumps and that's ongoing and we're helping with that as well um from NRS and what I would say about the biological control side of things is it really needs industry investment we're currently using extremely low level public sector funding and it is slowing the work up dreadfully um, yes I'm just wrapping up now Tom and that is my last slide I think um, yep okay thank you very much for your presentation Don't know if we have time for any questions because I've probably gone on a bit. So we'll just see if there's any quick questions. Uh, are there any online as well? Yes, yeah, so there's so one question from Wendy in the chat. Um, is there an option to use allopius pheromones to attract capture adults away from clear fell and conifer restock sites? Um, well, there, there hasn't actually been a pheromone <laughs> identified this uh, at this time. They're prob probably using the stumps to find um, a, a breeding partner because they the um, volatiles coming off the stump are attracting them in. So that I think there's less need for a long range pheromone in Hylobius than there perhaps is in other insects. Um, so that's something that's and they've been identified in terms of um, drawing them in. Nonetheless, when you're competing with huge amounts of volatiles, the chances of us producing enough pheromone that will move them um, to other areas are fairly limited, I think. Thank you. Are there any questions in the room? There's one question on here and one at the bottom. So, yeah, just to see this baby here. Um, hi, Ruth Pybus. I'm quite interested. Is there, and um, do you know of any interaction between butt rot and hylobius? So, if you've got a clear fell where you've had quite high, high level of butt rot, does that make the stumps um, less attractive for reproduction? Uh, well, it probably would, depending on how quick that comes in. Um, it's not something that we've to date done an awful lot of work on I must admit because obviously being an entomologist it's not <laughs> it's not something that um, that uh, would necessarily hold my interest for for as long but I think if, if you have a word with um, uh, Catherine uh, Tubby then you might uh, get a bit more uh, feedback so apologies for that but I'm not sort of equipped to answer that one particularly but anything that deteriorates the breeding resource is likely to impact the numbers of hylobius that come out out of the stump as long as it can get in quickly enough um, that it spreads within the breeding resource to and it's quick enough to reduce the populations uh, it needs to grow quickly basically thank you so one last question here at the front of the room um, the previous uh, question um i was going to add on to that why can't they use um, uh, traps before the felling begins by using the smell from the uh, from a cut tree? Is that possible? Um, well, we uh, we do use the volatiles that come off a, a stump to attract them, um, but the thing is that uh before felling takes place you know you've got standing mature trees the the population is very very low um you might get uh, well you do get i'm sure occasional insects in the tree canopy um but populations then are, are very low 
um, and it's only the felling of the trees and the huge amounts of vol volatiles that indicate the breeding resource that draw very large numbers in. Um, historically, um, Hylobius would have been a very rare insect. I know that's quite, <laughs> quite a difficult concept these days. Um, but the reason for them being quite rare was there wasn't um, uh, the, the breeding resource wasn't available to them very readily um, because it relied on think, um, unpredictable events like wind blow, primary insect attack or something of that nature killing the tree. And of course, those sorts of breeding resources were difficult to find and in small numbers. So the insect evolved to be highly efficient at detecting a dead tree. Um, so the fact that there weren't many of those kept the population low and we've created this as a man-made problem. We've given it as much breeding resource as it wants and it because it's efficient at finding it, it then flies in in huge numbers and um, creates big populations in the stumps that would, otherwise wouldn't really be there. Thank you very much, Roger. So we're going to break